When I was a student at uh, Moody Bible Institute in downtown Chicago, um, some time ago, uh, we, we had a group of friends that, that kind of lived in one section of the floor, and, and um, one of those guys that lived in that section of the floor, um, he was kind of not, he was not your prototypical Moody student. Um, for, for one thing, he, he came to Moody later on in life. He was a few years older than the rest of us. Um, and his story was a little bit different than a lot of our stories. Um, he had um, grown up and, and kind of in his high school teenage years sort of gotten caught up in the whole drugs and alcohol scene and really to the point of, of uh, a pretty um, all-encompassing addiction. Um, he eventually ended up in kind of a, a rehab facility called Teen Challenge where he met Christ. Um, and in and, and the midst of all of this was called to ministry and decided to study at Moody. And so he, he came in and kind of was just different than the rest of us. And, and Moody has a tendency, at least back in those days, like we're kind of a serious crowd. You know, it was, it was like you're, all these Bible students are there studying and learning. And, and back in those days, before Anton's day and Dustin's day, like we had to, we had to wear like collared shirts to class and slacks and stuff. These guys can wear like jeans and t-shirts now, so they don't, they don't know what it's like to suffer for the Lord. But, um, <laughs> but back in those days, it was kind of like a, a serious group. But my friend was always just a little bit different. And I, I remember there would be evenings when I would be studying or writing a paper or doing something. And kind of in the, in the hall outside of our room, you would just hear this outburst of like, celebration and praise and like Mike, his friend, his name is Mike, would go out there and he'd be walking up and down the halls with his hands raised, just praising Jesus at the top of his lungs. Just like almost like laughing at the reality that of God's goodness and the fact that he was saved was so overwhelming to him. Like, that it, like it got to a point where he couldn't contain it. And if he didn't shout up and down the halls of, of our of our dorm at Moody, it, like he was going to burst into flames or something. So you would just, every like once a month or so, you would just hear his door swing open and shouts of praise of Jesus, hallelujah, I'm sick, you know, he just needed to be like, there goes Mike, he's having a moment with the Lord, you know, like, and, and I remember thinking about that at one point in time. At first it was just kind of like, you were just sort of overtaken by it and you're like, wow, that's, you know, but Eventually, I sort of became to realize, I was like, why aren't, why aren't the rest of us like that? Like, why, why, because there was this kind of this contrast between how he operated and what it felt like was the culture or the norm in that moment to be perhaps a little bit more serious or to be a little bit more reserved. And yet, his gratitude for salvation could not be contained. And in those moments, that door would fly open and, and he would be stomping up and down and clapping his hands and celebrating. And it did not matter also what time of evening it was either. Um, so if he woke you up, then, then that was your problem. Um, and and it, I share this story because it reminds me of this parable that we're going to look at this evening. We've been studying, if you've been with us over the last few weeks, we've been looking at as we've, as we've taken on this topic, this subject of the life of Christ over this entire year together. Um, we have been focused on the last few weeks at looking at some of the parables that Jesus told and the kingdom priorities that he is establishing through these parables. And in the midst of the parable that we're going to look at together this evening, there is this, this stark contrast that exists that I think reveals perhaps something about the nature of maybe our tendencies or how we can kind of end up and also shows us something I think better um, or, or what I'm going to end up calling kind of the difference between religion and transformation. Um, let's turn to Luke chapter 7, the Gospel of Luke. This parable, by the way, it strikes me as a little bit different than, than some of the other ones that we have looked at because most of the parables that we've looked at, the, the priority of the passage, or the majority of it, I should say, has been Jesus telling the parable. And this example, the majority of the passage is what's taking place. It's the context. And it's just a sentence or two where Jesus breaks in and uses a parable to, to illustrate or demonstrate 
what's going on and what he's seeing and what kingdom priorities look like. Um, so this is Luke chapter 7. We're going to begin in verse 36 through the end of the chapter. It says, One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus is answering him, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered her house. I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you her sins, which are many are forgiven for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him begin to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What I would like to do as we process this text here for the next several minutes together is I, I want to look at the contrast that we see present in these verses. And the first, and perhaps the most obvious that stands out to us, is the contrast of these two characters. The contrast of the woman and the Pharisee. Simon, as, as we can see clearly in the text, is described as a Pharisee, somebody that is an expert in the law, highly religious. Um, they're part of the ruling class, and as a result, typically a Pharisee was was pretty wealthy. They were pretty well off. They had power and authority. What seems to be unique about Simon is that he seems to be someone who is, is curious. Um, as you know, and, and we've seen before, Jesus was not exactly a friend of the Pharisees. And, and, and no uncertain words throughout his time there, Jesus uh, was very critical and honest and direct about their abuse of power, about their lack of faith, about their utter failure to recognize and, and to acknowledge the arrival of the Messiah in, in the person of Jesus Christ. And so typically throughout the New Testament, what we see is, is Pharisees either try to avoid Jesus altogether, or they would, they would be meeting with him in order to gather evidence, in order to um, gather the sort of things that they could bring a charge against Jesus or to convince the people why they shouldn't be listening to Jesus. But, but Simon here is, he appears to be a bit different. As a matter of fact, it, it would seem as though he's even taking something of, of a risk here. His curiosity about Jesus, he seems to want to know more, and so he invites Jesus into his own home, which is culturally significant. An invitation into your home was, was a big deal. We see, again, we see this throughout the New Testament. People are critical of Jesus because he wines and dines with all these people that they feel like are, are not worthy, that they, they call like notorious sinners and all these sorts of things. So Simon's invitation of Jesus into his own home is, is a significant deal. Um, but, but it goes on from there. And this, this passage kind of reminds me a little bit of Nicodemus. 
Where Nicodemus in John chapter 3, if you remember, he goes to meet with Jesus in the middle of the night. Um, and, and Simon, in a similar fashion, and maybe even a bolder fashion, has now gone to, to meet with Jesus in order to satisfy his curiosity. In contrast to, to Simon, then, is this woman who has no invitation into the home, who burst into the scene. We only know her by the reference of she is a woman of the city who was a sinner. That along with the reference to the alabaster flask that she carried around her neck is an indication that this woman is or was a prostitute. That's what she did for a living. Um, she has no acclaim. She has no status, no power, no authority, no, no, no uh, positive presence in her society, no credential that she can present to Jesus. On the, on the social structure of their society, Simon the Pharisee and this woman of the city could not be on farther ends of the spectrum. They're two very, very different people, and now they both stand here in the presence of Jesus. And the Pharisee, with all of his status and all of his religious credentials and his education, and, and this woman who has none of that, has none of that, stand here in the presence of Jesus. These two very different people, and from two very different people now, we see a very stark contrast of response. A stark contrast of the way that they respond to being in the presence of Jesus. To set the context here for a moment, if you can imagine this, and, and try to sort of take in kind of the awkwardness of this scene, but they're having dinner around the table when a prostitute walks in, and starts weeping at the feet of Jesus and wiping her feet with her tears and drying his feet with her hair and, and rubbing them with ointment. And, and picture going to noodles after service tonight and that unfolds in front of you. Like to be fair, I think we'd all kind of be taken aback by that scene, by what is unfolding in front of them. We see here this this stark contrast of response back in verse 37 again. It says, And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. There's a very stark contrast here between the woman's response and what we see from Simon. The woman throws herself in this emotional moment at the feet of Jesus. Simon remains very removed. As a matter of fact, this whole exchange between, between Jesus and the woman, if you remember, Simon goes back and he says, if this man were really a prophet, then he would know who it is that is at his feet. Um, so this, this whole exchange for Simon is all kind of, maybe this guy's not all that he's cracked up to be. Look at the nature of the response here real quickly. Because Simon, to me, I think we see the difference, this contrast of a head versus a heart response. Simon is curious about Jesus. He wants more information. He's looking to know more. He's, he seems detached, almost intellectual about the whole exchange. Almost as if, I wonder what Jesus has to offer me. I wonder if there's something here that I can add on to what it is that I already have. The woman, in, in complete contrast, is, is responding to Jesus entirely with her heart. She is responding to Jesus entirely with her whole being. She throws herself at his feet in complete and utter humility in order to worship him as the best she can. I think here we see something between the difference of intellectual assent and heart transformation as it's demonstrated by this woman. 
Additionally, then, I think we see a difference between control and surrender. Jesus here in this moment, or excuse me, this, the, the Simon in this moment as he's meeting with Jesus, he, is, he remains again kind of removed, kind of in control of the room. The woman comes in and is entirely out of control. She's in a place of complete surrender. The significance of this and, and the decision that she's making is she is laying her life, her past, her present, and her future at the feet of Jesus. This alabaster flask that she carries with her, this was a, oftentimes in those days for a woman in her trade would, would wear an alabaster flask around her neck with an ointment. It was part of her allure. Um, part of what would draw someone in. She is now using this, and probably it was the item of greatest worth to her. Cost her the most money. This woman now is anointing Jesus' feet. This is, this is a picture of repentance. She's saying, I'm leaving this behind, this, this world, this culture, this person that I was, because I'm new now. We don't know. It's interesting because we don't know when she met Jesus. She, she ha- hears that he is in Simon's house. She bursts in, but there appears to have been a previous encounter where she has heard Jesus teach her. She's heard the gospel and she has responded to him. And now she is celebrating and worshiping him. Where Simon seeks control, this woman comes in and, and with her whole being lays everything down at the feet of Jesus. He, he is it. He is everything to her. All that she has, all that she ever wants, she leaves at the feet of Jesus. What's interesting, I heard one pastor point out, he said, we all, we all carry a flask around our neck. For Simon, perhaps it was his power and position and authority. For us, it may be something different, but we carry it with us and we pour it out the feet of something or someone. She here pours it out at the feet of Jesus. Again now, she is there, and and I think in this moment we capture this difference of priority, this contrast of priority. Uh, Jesus is in the home of of Simon, and he's treated like any other guest. He's treated like um, just an average, everyday guy. Perhaps even less so, because it point, Jesus points out later in the text, if you remember, he says, I've been here, you didn't give me anything to wash my feet, or you did not greet me with a kiss, or anoint my head with oil. But the woman, in stark contrast, Jesus is preeminent in the scene. It's almost as if she's completely unaware that anyone else is in the room. She is just there at the feet of Jesus. You see the contrast between how she approaches Jesus and how Simon approaches Jesus. Simon saw him as just another guest. The woman worshipped him as the preeminent one. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. The one for whom she owed everything. To this woman, Jesus is not one more thing. He is is everything to her. And now it's in the midst of this stark contrast then that Jesus tells a parable. He speaks into this moment. I I, I almost find it ironic here because Simon, in his head, he's thinking, well, if Jesus really knew who this woman was, he wouldn't be allowing her to do this. To remember, in their religious understanding, sin was sort of transmitted oftentimes by touch, right? You didn't touch something that was unclean or someone who was unclean. So for Jesus to allow this woman to, to touch his feet, Simon's like, well, clearly, clearly he isn't who he says he is. But I like, and I, you know, I, I think I've read this text before and perhaps not noticed this, but I like how Jesus responds to what Simon's thinking without ever hearing it verbally, you know? And you almost don't think that Simon necessarily catches this. He's like, well, if he were a prophet, and Simon says, can I speak into that for a moment? And so Jesus says, let me tell you a story. Look again back in Luke chapter 7, verses 41 through 43. 
It says a certain money lender who had two debtors, one who owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of them both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. What's interesting about this parable is, so Jesus puts these two people who both carry a debt. Obviously, there's a reference here to to the perception that Simon is the one with 50 and and the woman with this greater debt of of 500. Um, And Jesus, or God, would be the lender in, in this parable. And, and he asked him, who, who would love him more for canceling the debt? And what's interesting to note here is that despite the degree of their debt, they are both in the same boat. If, if in their culture and society, if you owed a debt and the lender came in to call that in, and you were unable to pay it, then, then the only option for you was to be put into prison, into debtor's prison until such a time that you could pay the debt, whether it was 50 denarii or 500 denarii. Jesus ultimately could have chosen anything. He could have made it five and five million because what he's doing here in this parable is he's, he's essentially placing them in the same boat. They both have the same need and, and the consequences in spite of that need are the same for them. And what he's pointing out is the gratitude between how they respond, how they see Jesus when that debt is forgiven. What he's pointing out to Simon is, is do you understand your need? The contrast that we see in the response here is directly related to the awareness of their need. And Simon doesn't yet get it. He doesn't yet understand what it is that he needs from Jesus, and this woman clearly does. He is is obviously offended by her sexual sin, and yet he remains entirely comfortable with his sin of of self-righteousness and spiritual pride. And Jesus points out, you're all in the same boat as a result of, of this contrast of response, then there is a contrast of capacity. Jesus points out an important implication that's taking place here in these verses. And that's our awareness of our need and God's ultimate provision for that need directly impacts our capacity to love. You see, this woman, she understood it. She got it. Jesus had met her greatest need, a debt that she could not pay. The result was unadulterated, unrestricted worship at the feet of Jesus. Simon holds back. He's cautious. He he remains in control because he does not yet understand what it is that his need is. I think, I think understanding our need, I think the contrast or this capacity contrast affects us in two ways. First, we see this, this response to and worship, this contrast and, and how we are able to love God and respond to Him. But then I think we also see a contrast as it relates to how we are to love other people. When, when this woman enters his home, Simon has no compassion. There's no sense of, I wonder what she needs or why she's here or what her story is. There's only judgment. But what is she doing here? And why is this man letting him, her touch his feet? You see, our capacity to love other people, to love other sinners, we're all in good company as it relates to that, is directly related to our understanding and awareness of our own condition. Our understanding and awareness of my own spiritual need, my own uh, uh, condition apart from Christ. See, I think when, when we become judgmental or we become self-righteousness or we become spiritually proud, we are failing to, to misunderstand one of two things, or perhaps both. We have either failed to understand the depth of our own sin, the debt that we owed, 
or we fail to understand the cost at which that, that came to cancel those debts. Lastly then, I think, and I'll wrap up with this, in this parable, we discover a contrast of religion and transformation. We see a stark difference between religion and transformation. Essentially, here in this parable, we, are, we see the difference between being religious as it's being demonstrated by Simon and being transformed as it's demonstrated by this woman. At the heart of the Gospel, we talk about every week in, in our church. We say we believe that the gospel transforms people and transform people change the world. At the heart of the gospel is an invitation to come to Jesus with nothing to offer, no credential that we could give Him, no good works, no self-righteousness. We give Him complete control and we allow Him to pay the price for the debt that we owe. In this passage, two people here are in the presence of Jesus. One appears to leave frustrated or confused or disillusioned, disappointed perhaps. The other is transformed. You see, when we enter the presence of Jesus, we are either one of those two people. There are no other options. We either hold back, we keep control, we remain in charge, or we fall at His feet. And we worship Him as the only one who can save us. The one who paid our debt for our sin. I think the overarching question of this parable that I have to ask myself, that we have to ask each other, is which one am I? Which one am I? As we meet with Jesus, as we worship Him, as we take communion, do I leave transformed? Or do I just try to add this on to every other credential and spiritual status and self-righteous thing that I can add to my list? Which one am I? Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, as we look into Your Word and we see this stark contrast of these two people standing in Your presence, Jesus, I pray that our hearts would be overwhelmed with gratitude for what it is that You have done for us. That we would be men and women who understand so clearly our need. The burden that sin has placed on us and that we would understand and respond to the reality that You have paid that price. That our debt has been cleared by You. Let us fall at Your feet. And just worship and glory and praise for who you are and what you've done. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.